So I was asked to speak on hormone replacement therapy and alternatives. And, and just to, and, and thank you Chitra for uh, setting the stage. You know, menopause is one of those things which can be, I mean, as a woman, I can tell you, um, can be quite difficult. And I'll give you some personal anecdotes also. But it is also the subject and object of ridicule. I mean, there are books written about it. Um, there are um, plays about it. And, um, and then there's all kinds of, you know, uh, memes and, um, and jokes. And we could be the, you know, all kinds of butt of all jokes, as you can you know, see this, but the only thing I like is I'm still hot and it's just coming in flashes. So this is the, you know, way people look at menopause and not really as a, uh, a, a medical situation or a, or a condition that women go through. I mean, I don't want to, uh, you know, medicalize menopause, but at the same time, the changes that are happening to a woman are very, very real, and what she goes through are very, very real. And we, as um, you know, healthcare providers, I think, um, have a responsibility to help them with this. So, as you can see, and this is also another joke, uh, menstruation, menopause, mental breakdown, everything, women's problems begin with men. Um, but at the same time, you could look at menopause as um, me, no pause. I mean, I'm not going to pause because I have gone through the menopause or going through it. Sarita and I can attest to that. Um, or you can look at as um, men or pause, pausing from men. And I just learned from uh, Professor Bansali that Dr. Dash called it the anniversary of cessation of menses. I like that. So every year you could actually celebrate an anniversary. So as uh, Chitra has said, there are many symptoms of menopause. There are vasomotor symptoms, genitourinary symptoms. Sleep disturbance is a very important thing. And because there are receptors in the brain, and it's almost like hot flashes happening in the brain. So women do have sleep disturbance, and, and sometimes some of the aches and pains, which are more like, um, um, you know, which they have after the menopause or while going through the menopause, maybe like a fibromyalgia related to the sleep disturbance itself. And then I'll show you something more on sleep. And then of course, skin, hair, and, and, and special senses, uh, joint pains, and then mood and depression. So because of the mood swings and the, some you know, real depression that can happen, and I think that is really the reason why menopause has been um, you know, butt of jokes. But this cognitive decline is something that I want to spend a little bit more time. Cognition is very important. And there also a new term, menofog. Around menopause, any woman who has gone through menopause will tell you, it's just like a fog, you are in a fog. You don't remember things, uh, you know, words come to you a little bit late. And then there's also a little bit of diffidence, lack of confidence in things. I was, again, mentioning to Dr. Bansali that when I was going through the menopause, I didn't want to drive. Someone who was able to drive anytime, anywhere, I suddenly felt more scared about driving and stopped driving for two or three years. I still don't like driving, but I have to. Um, so the age at menopause has remained constant. And why I think this menopause discussion is really important, because while the age at menopause has remained constant, life expectancy has increased so much. See, even from the times of Manu Shastra, we, menopause was supposed to be somewhere around 49 to 50 years. And there is an ancient Chinese proverb that says, for women, everything happens in multiples of seven. First tooth comes in at seven months, falls out at seven years, uh, puberty at 14, menopause at 49. You can't get better than that. In men, everything is in multiples, unfortunately, of eight. So they have andropause only around 64, lucky men, okay. So this, um, you know, how we approach menopause also has something to do with culture and ideology and what is the modern concept. In the modern concept, if women have menopause around, let us say, between 47 and 53, and this woman is going to live into her 80s and 90s, she's going to spend nearly half of her time after the menopause and face the consequences of that. And also many women are very productive, not I don't mean reproduction, but very productive in their 50s, 60s and 70s. So 
they, they need all the help that they can get if there is help that we can give them. So I just want to sum up this by saying we are not our grandmothers and our mothers. We are different women. Um, productivity continues well into the seventh and eighth decades. Longevity is greater in women. Physical changes may not be preventable, but that's aging, but it can be addressed. And NCDs are increasing. And women are particularly vulnerable to many of the NCDs, and we can see what, how we can connect the two. And quality of life ultimately is the key ingredient. How can we help this woman who is going through the menopause have better quality of life? So I won't go through the straw stages, just to point out that the symptoms can happen as much as four or five years before the actual cessation of menses, and then continue actually for most women, within a year, uh, most of the symptoms go away. For some, it may be two, for it may be five years. And for a few, it may go on for years and years when they are having hot flushes. But as you get older, the other symptoms, the genitourinary symptoms, vaginal dryness, UTIs, and those things start happening, and also changes when it comes to cognition and dementia. So I'll take you through a patient. We were actually going to discuss a patient at the end of this, but I thought I'll do this as a patient. A 52-year-old woman with amenorrhea, hot flashes and irritability, intolerable hot flashes day and night, mood swings, and irritability is harming her relationships at work and home, and sleeps only for three to four hours at a time. Her last menstrual period was February 2019, reported as of June 2019. But so technically speaking, if we follow Chitra's uh, thing, she really hasn't attained menopause, but she's going through the menopause. She has history of tension headaches, treated hypertension, and history of menstrual irregularities, but then she has also had um, endometrial biopsy that is negative, no history of depression or mental health. Two children, works, her mother has postmenopausal breast cancer, so that throws a big cloud over what we can do for her, and therefore it is important for us to get into the history in terms of mother and aunts and sister and grandmother, all about you know, estrogen dependent cancers that she could have. Also, she has a sister who has a fatal MI at age 53, which now becomes relevant from what after Chitra said about. So her medications are lisinopril for her blood pressure, and she's already on an agent called venlafloxine, 37.5 for the past seven days, because some, her physician put her on venlafloxine, which you know is an approved non-hormonal treatment for vasomotor symptoms and menopausal symptoms. It is a SSNRI, and uh, so it's a well-known uh, well drug for this. This is her blood pressure. She is overweight, she is obese, and a complete pelvic exam was done only a few years ago. PAP was normal, and all her chemistries are completely normal and was last done. So just to go back into the context of all this, what are we going to do with her? And as uh, Chitra has already talked about, in the 60s, especially based upon things like nurses' health study and others, which now we know is largely from health-seeking behavior, women who wanted to stay healthy took, did certain things. And then we thought that taking estrogen, and also a simple equation, menopause means less estrogen. Menopause means all these things. Pre-menopause means women with estrogen, and she's fine. Therefore, giving estrogen, everything should be fine. And that's what people believed. And all based on all these observational data, um, hormone replacement therapy was very, very big. Till the WHI, which came out, um, and I think was a bombshell study, and uh, they stopped the study early because um, treated women had more breast cancer and more cardiovascular events and more thromboembolic events. And in 2004, they had an estrogen arm only, that the people who have had a hysterectomy, and they also had increased stroke and thromboembolic disease, and there was no overall mortality reduction. So anytime we are doing something from a more preventive strategy, the first thing is do no harm you know, more than do benefit, we don't want to do any harm. So sorry. 
Okay, so after the WHI, obviously the hormone use fell uh, you know, dramatically, but however, in the last 10 years, there's an enhanced understanding of the, you know, even the studies have been sliced more carefully, people have taken like, deeper dives into the data, and more evidence has emerged of short-term benefit and better understanding of the short-term and long-term risks, because we don't want to deny to the, some few women who will benefit from this, or the women who are really suffering a lot. And smaller RCTs have suggested some benefit, and the long-term follow-up was also published. So um, in 2017, the North American Menopause Society consensus panel of experts, based on the accumulating long-term evidence, they updated their guideline. And then it was supported by the subsequent. So what they said was estrogen therapy, most effective treatment of menopausal vasomotor symptoms must be paired with an progestogen for women with the uterus. If you don't pair it, you might do improve the vasomotor symptoms, but you will give her endometrial hyperplasia and even potentially um, endometrial cancer. Prescribe the lowest effective dose, and vasomotor symptoms recur in half the women who stop HRT because, again, they will be going through kind of the menopause, regardless of age and duration. So we'll have to kind of taper it and also keep the woman empowered about, you know, how safe it is and, and what we are expecting. What about the effect of uh, hormone therapy on mood? Uh, mixed evidence, short term suggests some benefit, others showing no real benefit on mood. There may be more of a placebo effect when you give these agents and say your mood will benefit. In terms of hypertension and cardiovascular events, this hyper, um, HRT is safe, effective, when initiated in women under 60 or within 10 years of menopause onset. If initiating it more than 10 years, and the studies are suggesting an increased risk in cardiovascular studies. So if you, if you start it too late, more cardiovascular events. If you give it longer than four or five years, increased risk of breast cancer. And even in the first one or two years after starting, because estrogen is kind of pro-inflammatory, there is increased risk of venous thromboembolism and PE. So early, your goose is cooked with this thromboembolic events. You give it too long, breast cancer can happen. You start it too late, cardiovascular events can happen. So now you see what kind of a, you know, really careful thing that you have to do. Carefully select the patient who will benefit from it and carefully consider the dosage you will use. So con consider the, this is as good as it comes when it comes to personalized medicine. Consider individual patient risk for cardiovascular disease, stroke, venous thromboembolism before starting hormone replacement therapy. And consider hormone therapy on breast cancer may depend on the type, patient level risk factors, and duration of treatment. Very low, ex so whenever we look at odds ratios and risk ratios and hazard ratios, it doesn't tell us actually absolute risk. When it comes to absolute risk, it may just be a handful of more women compared to women who did not take it. But then, again, when it comes to preventive strategies, we don't want to do any harm at all. So to be individualized in the absence. Next comes. So going again back to the symptoms, um, vasomotor symptoms. Um, Chitra has gone through this, so I'm not going to do this. But then also, as you can see, during the pre-menopause, perimenopause, and post-menopause, what is happening to the, to the hormonal fluctuations, which could actually lead to changes in, you know, brain in neurotransmitters and other, um, and, and that is really what is causing many of the changes in women. So for vasomotor symptoms, we have many options, high-dose estrogen, standard, low-dose, then the um, SNRIs we talked about, gabapentin. So the last four, the isoflavones, the black cohosh, the ginseng, placebo, those kind of agents, short answer, no real evidence, potentially could be even be unsafe. So let's not go anywhere near those. So when you're treating vasomotor symptoms, in a woman with an intact uterus, it's low-dose estrogen plus a, preferably a micronized progesterone. If in a woman without a uterus, you can consider low-dose estrogen. For shorter duration, of course, the woman should be completely empowered about this. 
So duration and tapering, unfortunately, very little information is available to guide the physicians in helping women who have difficulty stopping the hormone therapy. And one study showed no difference whether you tapered it over a long period of time, short period of time, taper in quarter increments with a minimum of three month interval. So we, we do need to bring it down gradually so that women again don't start going through the menopause. And also there is a natural evolution over a period of time, all the vasomotor symptoms and others are going to go away. So maybe by that time, the woman has already come to that. So can, you can also use transdermal estrogen, not very popular in India because of our humidity and other problems and also more expensive. But the only thing is it does have the, you know, avoids the first pass effect through the liver. So you can avoid things like hypertriglyceridemia, which can happen with HRT. And also there seems to be less uh, venous thromboembolic events as well. But uh, if you want to use oral estrogen, 0.625 of conjugated estrogen, or you can use you know, one milligram of uh, um, estrogen, and you can use micronized progesterone. Other options are of course peroxetine 10 milligram or gabapentin at night, or as this lady had started, um, venlafloxine. So, what about things like mood changes and depression? So depressive symptoms seem to be more common in some studies, whereas clinical depression was not significantly increased. Again, in some studies, moderate to severe vasomotor symptoms seem to correlate also with depressive symptoms, which may have something to do with sleep disturbances and, uh, and how quality of life is affected. So depression in menopause correlates also with past history of depression, postpartum depression, premenstrual dysphoric disorders, and progestogens, we all know, can worsen mood symptoms. What about genitourinary symptoms? Worsens over time, unlike vasomotor symptoms, vaginal dryness, dyspareunia, urinary frequency, urgency, dysuria, recurrent UTIs, incontinence. Here, vaginal estrogen is superior even to oral estrogen, just to show you. Um, then comes the uh, menopause and sleep issues. When it comes to vaginal estrogen, let me just add one more thing. You can use it every day for a week, you can recommend every day for a week or two. Then you can easily go to three days a week or even some women do well with two days a week. And there is minimal absorption. So with great uh, reassurance and safety, you can use vaginal estrogen. What about sleep issues? You can see prevalence of hot flashes obviously correlates with insomnia. Significantly spend longer time awake at night and have lower sleep efficiency. And you can see the correlation. And also there seems to be more sleep apnea with menopause. So post-menopausal women um, compared to, um, you know, uh, they have more obstructive sleep apnea. And um, so when you look at non-hormonal treatments, if we are not going to go with hormone therapy based upon all that I have talked about, these are the options that we have. We can use SSRIs like paroxetine. You can use SNRIs like venlafloxine. You can use gabapentin. And FDA approval is for paroxetine, and I think venlafloxine is also something that is approved. Uh, most trials are uh, trial agent versus placebo and not the conventional hormone therapy. Um, venlafloxine 75 versus estradiol 0.5, both effective with slight advantage to estradiol. So how do we give the estrogen? I just want to show you. Um, you know, you can use the 0.625 of conjugated equine estrogen, or you can use oral E2, um, one milligram, and uh, transdermal estrogen, like I mentioned, is, has its benefits, but may not be uh, easily available, more expensive, and our humidity may be an issue. And use very low dose progesterone, and preferably micronized progesterone. So age also seems to matter in terms of um, um, you know, conjugated equine estrogen plus medroxyprogesterone in terms of the excess risk, as you can see, whether it's coronary artery disease or breast CA or stroke um, or mortality, the younger the woman, the benefit of mortality seems to be more. So therefore, use it in the younger women. Um, and even though the studies, the WHI and others included a lot of women, you know, older women. Um, and if you look at difference in absolute, um, you know, risk again for, um, for, co for conjugated equine estrogen alone, again, mortality is much lower when you use it in younger women. So, um, 
cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, decreased severity in RCTs, clinical hypnosis, decreased severity and frequency in two RCTs, soy, no benefit. In fact, there may be some harm if we use uh, soy and soy products because, you know, in, in terms of uh, soy's effect on the breast, we do not know. It's after all, uh, um, uh, you know, an estrogen itself. Uh, and black cohosh, uh, you know, trials are mixed, again, not recommended. So how long should, you know, will she have symptoms and what are the risks of treatment? Uh, Chitra has already mentioned uh, those. So many women, as you can see, uh, depending upon when vasomotor symptoms started, they could have a long duration or if it only started postmenopausally, it could be as short as, you know, two to three uh, or three or four years. And the symptoms may not be as severe and gradually they wane off. So let me quickly end by saying, um, we don't want to get into breast cancer. Just to tell you that it did, the WHI did show a slightly increased risk of breast cancer in women who were put on the estrogen plus progesterone compared to the estrogen alone. And all cause mortality definitely, uh, uh, you know, did improve. So recommendations for our patient, many women don't require treatment. Um, symptom severity and timing will suggest the number of years of treatment and treatment course with uh, hormone replacement would increase her risk of breast cancer and so for her given all her other problems family history of breast cancer sister's history of cardiovascular disease uh, venlafaxine or other antidepressant and, and gabapentin so this is the summary slide of risk and benefit of menopausal hormone replacement therapy and on this side are the risks and and that side are the benefits. So very carefully one has to uh, you know, weigh the risk-benefit ratio. At this point, simple short answer, only for treatment of severe vasomotor symptoms or mood symptoms, short duration, lower dosage, and the patient well aware and well screened, as Chitra has said, with baseline mammography and pap smear and, and counseling. Thank you so much.